we're going to be spending, like I made mention, we're going to be spending uh, the next hour here on a little bit of PowerShell uh, being used in the hacking world. And I thought I better at least uh, let you know who you're dealing with here. Uh, my name is Dwayne Anderson, one of the uh, security consultant and instructors with uh, Mile 2. Uh, I've, um, look, there's, uh, I'm supposed to be an expert, but I always struggle to say that because there's always somebody better than me. Uh, um, it doesn't, you don't have to go that far. Uh, I have been in the industry for quite a while, and I do travel the globe. I've, I've uh, actually offered uh, um, training and or consulting in 35 different countries around the globe. So I have quite a bit of uh, global experience there. And I'm going to share a little bit about the, you know, some of the experiences as we go through here, some of the things that I do see out there in the world. And I've worked with anything from uh, large governments uh, to banks to, uh, you know, small businesses. So I, I, I got a wide range of everything in between. Uh, some are really, really good and fun, and others aren't so much good and fun. It just kind of <laughs> depends upon. All right, so uh, I do spend a lot of my time in virtualization and cloud. Uh, um, now, why does that matter? Well, it doesn't matter a whole lot other than the fact that uh, I just wanted you guys to know that uh, fair bit of my experience is going to be off of virtual machines, good, bad, or otherwise. So uh, we're all good there. Okay. So why, what are we covering, and why does it matter? So first of all, we're going to take a, a few minutes and talk about what PowerShell is, and I mean just a few minutes. I am not going to bore you to death with a, a two-hour discussion on what PowerShell is and what it can do for you. That's not what we're here to do. We're going to get you into the meat of it here fairly quickly. Uh, we're going to we're also going to talk about why we care. Um, why is this a big deal today, and what's actually happening out there in the industry uh, from a not so good point and from a good point? Uh, I will tell you guys that I am a big believer in utilizing PowerShell in companies, especially when it comes to proper auditing. Uh, talk about an easy way for continuous auditing to to take take effect, and I'll probably talk about that here um, towards the end uh, when we talk about a little bit of or discuss a little bit of prevention here. We're going to make sure that you guys know what you need to do to make it work and and how to go about utilizing it, and then we're going to go walk through the different parts of pen testing uh, and and what we can actually do here and what. Um, uh, um, yeah, so what we can do here and what we can't do here. Uh, there's good and bad with this, and we'll walk through some of that. I'll show you how we've utilized it, how others have utilized it, and, and it does go way beyond. The intent of this webinar is to get you guys started. So we're not going to be going into scripts that are... 175,000 lines long, which they could be, but it's not likely. Uh, we're going to be going through some of the basics so that you understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, and that'll get you a really, really good start. And we're going to finish up talking about prevention, uh, which is awesome, some of the things that have been added into the latest version of this. All right, so what is PowerShell? I love this statement here. A uh, good friend of mine out of the UK, uh, Tom Howarth, is a big PowerShell guy, Power CLI guy, and, and he coined the term, as far as I know, uh, get PowerShell, get life. Uh, I will state that those that utilize PowerShell are often utilizing it in such a way that they lower the amount of time that it takes for them to actually perform and do work, uh, which is, um, let's just say that's pretty cool, right? Uh, we've, uh, I have seen time and time again organizations that actually implement this and implement it right. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can have time to go golfing. You can have time to go fishing, well, you know, whatever your, your hobby is, rather than spending 24-7 at the, at the shop. Although, although you could also just fill your time with other things as well, right? So let's not go there. So get PowerShell, get life. It is, the, it is a very common tool today and becoming even more common. And it's simply 
a task automation and configuration management framework. That's it. It's going to automate tasks and automate configuration. It allows us to do everything from changing settings, adding users, adding machines, changing configurations on systems, in Active Directory, whatever the heck you're dealing with. I utilize Power CLI all the time when configuring VMware virtualization, VMware vSphere. I love that tool. It really saves me a ton of time. I use scripts for many, many of those components. So this goes, this goes way beyond just a Microsoft product. There, there are a lot of other tools. And it's interesting to take note um, that this was made open source and cross-platform just last year. So we're going to continue to see this expand, good and bad, right? <laughs> continue to see this expand, both good and bad. Okay, so why do we care? I could have went to a lot of different reports. I just de decided to uh, grab the unified threat report from Carbon Black. Um, there's a lot of good organizations out there. Carbon Black is one of many. And they had seen um, in, in last year, 2016, 38% of the incidents reported by their partners had utilized PowerShell. That is fairly significant. This is not 5%, 10%. We're talking 38% of the reported incidents, so who knows about the unreported, had made use of PowerShell. Very interesting. So during those investigations, 68% of the companies Responding partners encountered PowerShell. Almost a third reported getting no security alerts before the investigation of incidents related to um, a scripting language. Yes, that's a typo. I like to point out my typos. That's supposed to say language. It's all good. So the cool thing here, right? No security alerts. Well, why is that? Well, we think about PowerShell, right? PowerShell is an authorized API, an authorized service, an authorized process that runs, works with many of these different operating systems. And if an organization is utilizing them, any user on the system can make use of PowerShell in whatever manner is allowed by the organization or the firm. We'll talk about some of the, the good and bad related to that. So it's not likely you're going to get very many security alerts unless you have a high level of security related to the use of PowerShell, which is not common. Uh, very few people even know some of the new, new, new uh, capabilities with uh, PowerShell version 5. So, so, so we're, we're getting there, right? We're, we're getting there. But no security alerts, very common. And, and we're going to walk through just a basic scenario. I'm going to talk about where and what and all that kind of good stuff. So the majority of attacks, 87%, were related to click fraud. Fake antivirus programs and ransomware, but social engineering techniques are still the favorite language. 87% click fraud, social engineering. Geez, you've never heard that before, have you? <laughs> nope, something new today, right? I'm just kidding. So, so again, Common, common, common items related to uh, related to these attacks, and so once we get on a system, regardless of the user's privileges, if PowerShell is being used in the environment, the user will be able to utilize it. So keep that in mind, okay? All right. So how do we make it for, for make it work? First of all, PowerShell is already part of the Windows OS. Uh, we're going to be spending our time uh, here. I've got uh, an entire hacking environment set up in our totally awesome cyber range. I'm, I, okay, I think it's totally awesome. It's a fun place to go to be able to hack and be safe. Um, all of these systems are isolated. They do have internet access, but they're isolated. The only place they go is to the outside world and back in. Uh, and then they can, of course, pick on each other all they want. Now, we're going to be spending our time, I've got a, a Windows 10 VM that we're going to be utilizing. Windows 10 has PowerShell built, built into it, right? And then um, I'm actually, um, to the dismay of 
one of my colleagues, I'm actually going to be doing a bunch of enumeration information gathering out of this Active Directory um, that we have set up for most of our classes. Now that's just what we're going to be doing. And then we're going to make use of Kali Linux towards the end if we have time. If not, I'll just walk through exactly what I'm doing. We'll see, we'll see how the time goes. Because I talk a lot. All right, so I'm going to show you guys. We're going to be making use of Windows PowerShell. Uh, and um, you know, I'm going to just click here and just type PowerShell. Now Windows 10, Windows 8.1 uh, comes with uh, Windows PowerShell, both the 32-bit and the 64-bit, uh, and uh, PowerShell ISE. Now, I like PowerShell ISE only because I can run multiple different um, programs all in one. I'm not a big guy making use of functions. I'll talk about that later on. You can write your own little program uh, script as a function. Uh, that uh, that you can run uh, from command line, you know, with a dot uh, backslash and away you go. I think that's right. I always get the backslash and forward slash mi mixed up, but you know, once you make a mistake, once you figure it out. So that's where that's where we're going to be spending our time here as we go through this. So it's all built in. That's always good, right? We love the fact that it's built in. You need a user account. Now, one of the things that's that's a little dangerous about PowerShell, in my in my opinion, is that you do not have to have administrative rights uh, to make use of PowerShell. Um, a user can make use of PowerShell if it is if it is set up to work. Now, there's going to be restrictions on PowerShell based upon uh, whatever security, if any, security mechanisms you have in place, and we'll finish up talking a little bit about them at the end of the session. Now, this is important. So if me as a hacker is going to make use of any scripts, uh, we're going to need to either utilize remote signed or unrestricted. And, and we'll go through, uh, I, I've got that in the next slide, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. There is, um, uh, uh, you can allow none, no scripting. You can allow all signed scripts, meaning they're going to be signed based upon a, a certificate or, or, or a signature mechanism that you guys utilize. You can use remote sign, meaning that they can be scripts that are signed by any, any place that can be verified. Now, that's also dangerous if the systems have internet access because I can sign my own scripts and have them be validated and verified by uh, uh, my own CA. Uh, so as a hacker, that's not a big deal. But I most commonly see companies that are utilizing PowerShell, they utilize the unrestricted scripts. And it's real simple. Individuals that love and use PowerShell are constantly improving the scripts, are constantly changing the scripts, adding new ones. It is a real pain in the backside to go through the signing process on every single little change you make inside of a script. So I don't see it limited very often. I see it unrestricted more often than not. Now, I will tell you that in the banking in industry, most banks, not all, but most banks do have them signed, especially when we're getting into specific areas. Um, they will require them to be signed or on specific systems. Now, the thing, the thing is, is that some people might say, well, we're not going to allow unsigned scripts to run um, in, um, or unrestricted scripts to run against particular systems. So we're going to reduce that. And that, that is a benefit. That will help some, but that is not the common. That is not the norm because of the difficulty or the time it takes. It's not that it's really hard, it just takes time to go through that signature process. Now, an administrator does have to set that up. You have to have administrative rights in order to set it up for uh, um, a remote signed or unrestricted. And, and um, that's normally done, We, as a hacker, we wouldn't have to worry about that anyways. That's already done and set up and part of the in, entire process or system. So it's all good. They would also need to add the remote server administration tools. Now, 
that is only true if we want to make use of some of the items that I am going to demonstrate today. There are pre-built in uh, um, pre-built modules already installed, but many of them take administrative rights to run. What I am demoing for you guys today does not take administrative rights in order to get the information. We're actually going to be querying an Active Directory for a ton of different information to see what we can find within the environment. So you do have to add the remote server administration tools, which is quick and easy to download, and there's a quick link for you to, to go and grab that. And like I said, we are recording this, so we will um, uh, make this available for you guys after um, and sometime later later this week after we get everything set. So how do you how do you use it? It's built into Windows, so it's I think it's fairly easy. You'll you'll first be you know so we're talking about us setting up a demo environment. Uh, if if you're already hacking into some places, that's a different story. Okay, maybe I shouldn't use hacking, right? Because that would be illegal. Everything that we're doing today, you do have to have authorized rights to do so. Uh, um, the, some of the first components are fine because it would be, if you're an admin, you're not doing anything illegal in these first, uh, uh, first components that we're going to walk through. Now, when we start um, putting a reverse shell on or, or, or something of that nature, well, that's a different story. So you, you log in as an admin or you file, fire up PowerShell with administrative rights, and then you just simply type set execution policy unrestricted. Now I've already done that, not gonna go through that again, but that's all you need to do. And that is fairly easy, simple, and well, common, all right, fairly common. Then we download and install the RSAT. And it's a simple download. You double click on it, installs. Now we're ready to go and we can move on. Now, normally these items are installed on a bunch of different systems out here. Um, now, I will also tell you that um, this scenario assumes one of two things. You have either social engineered your way onto a box already, and, we, and we'll walk through some of those components later on, or you have. Uh, um, uh, or you are an employee with general user rights on the inside, uh, and you've got a grudge, so you're 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 wanting to do you know some damage to the company, or maybe you're a salesman and you want access to certain data that you can't get access to before you leave, a a or maybe you were a a, a victim of of uh, uh, of uh, a client side attack. Uh, utilizing uh, click jacking of some type, right? So there's a lot of different options out there, but we are going to need because this is you're not going to you're not going to run PowerShell from home uh, uh, to a system that you don't have access to. That's obviously not going to happen. So we're talking about inside of an organization uh, in first. You got to be inside the organization first, and then we need to understand some scripting variables, and 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 we're going to go through some of them here uh, in a moment. So we're going to walk through different parts of, uh, of the pen testing here. So first of all, can we do information gathering? Well, yeah, but for what we're doing, it's an absolute waste of time. We don't need to mess with it, okay? Uh, we're just going to go right down to enumeration. We don't need to do scanning. We don't need to reach out and touch the system because as a general user, you have rights to query Active Directory. And you can query Active Directory for a ton of information. That is what is really cool. So we're going to be spending our time on enumeration. We're going to demo a simple attack um, that, as an insider, is actually pretty darn easy to do. And um, we'll discuss leaving a back door. If I get to demoing it, we will. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, I'll at least explain it. And um, We'll clear some event logs for the fun of it and all that kind of good stuff, right? So are we having fun yet? So we're going to go through and do some enumeration. Now, first thing we have to understand is get statements. Get is just that. We are asking for information. We are querying something to gain a little bit of information. When it comes to Active Directory, any user can query 
the AD for said information. It's not quite the same when we're dealing with uh, uh, other systems that we may or may not have access to remotely. Uh, if we don't have rights to be on the box, we won't be able to query said box. And there's a few other things. For example, I cannot get event logs as a general user. I would have to be admin, okay? So the uh, get statements are very important to us, and we're going to gather a ton of information to be able to demo what uh, a, simple, uh, a simple attack that, that we've done inside systems uh, multiple times and had fairly decent success as we're learning more about it, okay? All right. Next, um, uh, get the AD user. All right, that makes sense. We're going to gather information about the Active Directory user. We're going to gather information about the computer. We can even talk about get service. Uh, now, get service does require you to be an admin. All right, so we do have to be an admin in order to make that one happen. So before we even start getting, to, uh, getting the uh, service, we've got to figure out how we can become an admin. All right, so what I want to do here is roll you guys through a few different options as we are um, and explain what's going on so you can kind of see what we can and cannot do here. All right, so I'm in, a, I'm in my Windows 10, and I want, to, I want to point out two things. I have two different Windows PowerShell ISC items open. This one, as you can see, in the upper left here, is being ran as an administrator. All right, so we're not going to utilize this one to start with. Okay, I am going to utilize a general user, and you know it's a general user because it does not say administrator in front of it, okay? Now, a general user, as I made mention, you can see down at the bottom, I'm logged in as student 100. Woohoo! So, I'm the 100th most important person in the company today, which is sad because there's only 10 of us. Um, <laughs> Come on, that was funny. I'm just messing around. It wasn't that funny. All right, so what we're going to do here is I got some different scenarios that I've laid out. And yes, I did just uh, make it easy on myself by making it so I can copy and paste here. And I could just run the whole thing. This is a scripting tool. So I could just run all of these. I could comment some of them out and do what I needed to. We're going to start with getting user details. And that's what my plan is, is to kind of dig through this. So the first thing I want you to understand is we're running as a student 100, and I'm going to simply utilize the get ad user command. And, and the dash filter, I could filter by a lot of things, and I'll demo some of that. But we're going to get all of the details for every, well, not all the details. That's not true. We're going to, we're going to actually um, get all users, and, and it will return just a few details back here. So I'm going to press enter here. And I'm going to let it finish. And then we'll go take a look at what I've done here. So this bottom one, let's just look at this. So we, we can see the distinguished name for an account that's not mine, right? We can see that this is enabled. That's cool. The given name, service account, well, S-R-V-A-C-C-T, right? Short for service account. Name, the object class, it is a user, okay? User. Now, Scroll up here. I probably should just. Uh, I think I'll wait and do and do the uh, another command another way because it'll take me too long to find what I want. We got our object. We got our Sam uh, account name, our SID, and uh, don't have a surname there and user principal name. All right, cool. That's pretty normal stuff. I think you could have guessed most of that just being part of the organization, right? That sounds pretty normal. Well, let's take a look at more of the properties. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at all of the properties here for student 25, and then we're going to see if we can take a look at the same for the administrator account, okay? 
there is some good information in this, and there are a ton of properties here. This is not just a one-stop shop and a small, quick item here. All right, so here's student 25. So we have, if there's an expiration date on the account, when the account uh, expires, you have to go look up those numbers because I can't tell you exactly what it means. I gotta go look it up with Microsoft, it's all good. The account lockout time, there isn't one right now. Uh, account not delegated, okay, that's cool. Allow reversible password encryption. Now this is an interesting one. Uh, and you'll see that we have one account that allows for reversible password encryption, but the user didn't set it up correctly, uh, or the administrator. We'll discuss what's going on. This one's an interesting one because this actually lowers your level of encryption. Um, this makes it easier for us to, um, uh, to brute force, makes it easier, easier for us to uh, crack the encryption utilized because it is reversible. The, um, uh, so we like to look for allow reversible password encryption just because it can make it easier. There's also a tool called RV Dump uh, that you can download and run that you can actually dump the uh, uh, reversible password encryption in clear text. Uh, it's a it's an interesting tool. It's not I'm not going to tell you it's the easiest thing to work, but but it is uh, it is kind of interesting. All right, so um, what else do I want to talk about here? There's a couple of other items. If you have a bad password, um, uh, bad login count, it'll record those here. Notice here that the user cannot change the password. Well, that's good news for us, right? Um, we don't have to worry about that happening in the future. That's, that's, I always like looking for those things. What else might be interesting in here? Display name, all good. Does not require pre-authorization. Well, well, that's bad. They do require pre-authorization. That'd be kind of nice to know if there was an account that did not require pre-authorization. There's a couple of other items I was going to point out here if I get down to them. Um, whether or not they're locked out. Oh, that's good. They're not locked out. Last log off, uh, bad password attempt. Last bad password attempt. At least it record, records those things. It's kind of interesting. MNS log on account. Not a big deal there. Let's see. What else did I want to talk about? I know there was something else that I wanted to point out. And it might come to me as I look down through here. Password's not expired, that's good. Last set, never expires is true. Password not required, I always like to look for those. In this case, um, that is false. I'd like that to be true, but that's not the case. All right, so let me see. Is there anything else here that I want? Just kind of looking down through these. You can see there's a lot of information here. Whether or not it's trusted for delegation, trusted to um, auth for delegation, so uh, not happening there. All right, I guess we're going to be good enough. So there's a lot of information here. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to roll through. Let's let's just do a quick um, up arrow here, and let's uh, instead of student 25, let's see if we can get that same information for administrator. All right, well, that's good to know. User certificate, well, that might be useful. Yeah, you want to uh, be able to do some certificate injection, fake yourself as the user. Uh, that might be very useful for us. Uh, let me see here. So you can see it's all the same details as to what we had seen before. Uh, uh, which is good, right? I know what I wanted to look for. Just looking to see if it's trusted for delegation. It is not. Now, we can also just do a simple one. Instead of getting all the properties, we can just get the basic items for the administrator here. So we can see that it's enabled. It's still a, uh, a, a user, yeah? 
SAM account name. So what we're getting at here is that even though I'm a normal user, I just gathered quite a bit of information related to, um, yeah, related related to uh, those components. Now, um, yeah, that's a, a good example as well. Uh, one of the individuals uh, um, made mention, uh, which is which is good, that uh, with the member of, we can see how much power that user actually has, what uh, what different groups they're in. Um, that's a that's a good good one to be looking at as well. I completely forgot about that, so I appreciate that. It's good stuff here, right? A lot of good information that we can gather from this. So let's go down through here and and just talk about what's happening on these next items. So. To get AD user, um, we can use this filter command, and we can filter for any of the properties that were that were listed in that long list to make our job easier. So we're going to take a look at and see if there's any users that have the password not required equal to true. Well, if there was one, that might be kind of nice, right? Oh, we got one. And of course, it's the guest account and it is not enabled. So that's going to be a waste, right? But boy, that would have been awesome if we would have found someone that said password not required. We start thinking about start thinking about different services that some companies have running and and uh, the different service accounts. There are there are organizations that have service accounts that do not require a password due to the particular application that they have they have running. Usually they're a little older in nature, but it is it is the case and could possibly be the case. So we do want to look for that. And look how hard it was for me as a normal user to go find that particular system. And of course we don't know what they're a member of, what kind of power they have. Of course we can see that one here, but um, uh, but you start thinking through the enumeration process here. We've got a lot of items here. Now we can also do just the opposite here. We can actually look at a particular user and validate its property uh, to take a good look at, at that particular user. So what happens is, is when you run this particular uh, command, we're going to get all of the normal items that we, re that we gather when you do a standard get AD user. But we're also going to add the the property password not required. So notice it did come back, distinguished name, given name, all that stuff, but it also included the password not required set to true. But sadly, like I said, this one is enabled to be false. Well, I made mention that, um, uh, you know, about this filtering, I made mention about the allow reversible password encryption. So let's go ahead and do a filter for that, shall we? I'm glad you guys are saying, yeah, Dwayne, let's do that. Let's test that. All right, so here you go. We just did a allow reversible password encryption, and there was one user, that service account, that has that actually set to true. Now, that's interesting. Usually, oh, I just did a filter for it. Sorry, I did a filter for it. I was thinking, I was thinking about this bottom one here, um, uh, when it would actually pop that up. So that account must have the allow because that's all we did is filter for it. So now I'm going to validate it, utilizing this other one where we're actually searching for that particular property, and that's at the top, and that's set to true. So that's interesting, which means that this could be weaker authentication. Now, in order to in order to verify or validate that. Let's go see what the domain password policy is. And then, I, and then I'll explain some of the various components here related to it. I'm just going to do a quick uh, get domain password policy. Now, um, I want you to keep in mind that if there was more than one domain, we can connect to and provide specific domains in here. I, we only have one domain set up, so we're sticking with that one and utilizing it. But if there was more than one, more than one group, if you have custom password policies on particular groups, we can query that as well. That's not set up in this environment, so that's why we're sticking with what we have here. Okay, so um, we can see the complexity 
is enabled. Well, that's good news. The distinguished name, MWHA.local, that stands for Midwest Housing Association. Woohoo! All right. Uh, lockout duration and observation window is 30 minutes. Now look at this one, though. This is interesting, the lockout threshold. This is the default setting for Windows. There are, so when it's set to zero, that means that we can have as many bad logins as we want. We are never going to be logged out. You set it to one, you have one bad login, you will be out for 30 minutes. You set it to three, you'll have up to three bad logins, then you'll be locked out for 30 minutes. But at zero, that means it is off. That means that, that there is no lockout threshold, which is really cool. Um, our maximum password age by default is 42 days, but we already saw that some of those accounts uh, um, we are ne were never required to change. Minimum password link, or sorry, minimum password age is seven. The password length, sorry, the minimum password length is seven, but the age is, is uh, one day. Um, object class, domain DNS, yay, yay, yay. we can, we, uh, we can um, password history count, uh, we, they keep 24, but since we never change it, it doesn't matter, but the bottom one, notice here, reversible encryption enabled, it is set to false. Now, in order for that user to actually work in function, he needs to fall under a po password policy that would also be set to true. So usually when companies are making use of that, they will have a separate OU just for those users and they'll have a custom domain po password policy for that OU, for that organizational unit. And then that would be set to true and then when you set the user to true, then it is saved. Um, and I'm sharing that information because uh, when you go to gather uh, some uh, passwords, in, in when we were when we go to enumerate some of these items, we could actually get that in clear text if it was set to allow reversible encryption. But that's not the case. So now, here is the key behind this. Okay, here is the key behind this. The reason that I think this is so dangerous is when we know the lockout threshold. This is important. Okay, lockout threshold and lockout time. I want you to stop for a minute and 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 we're gonna walk through. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to get some OS details and we're gonna walk through doing some dictionary attacks. But I want you to keep in mind, even if you had this set to three, I am going to try two passwords and I'm gonna put a wait in my script and I'm gonna wait for 30, 30 minutes. I'm going to try two more passwords. I'm going to wait for 30 minutes. I'm going to try two more. You see what I'm getting at? Regardless of what this is set at, we can run a script for a long time and try to guess the password. We know the password um, uh, minimum password length. And if we have any idea about the organization and its people, the, the bigger the company, the more likely you're going to find some passwords. Right, just just use the top 100 passwords. You will find somebody utilizing them. I can almost guarantee it. We do every time. So it's just kind of an interesting thought process behind what is what is happening out there and what can be done. So we're just going to walk through some of that. Um, all right. So we've talked about the getting the user details. Let's go take a look at the operating system. Now, in the operating system, they have get AD computer. And yes, we are communicating with the AD because some of the items that we would want to do specifically to a system does require, does require administrative rights. So we're not going to go there. So let's take a look at get AD computer with our filter asterisk, just like we had done before. So there's a ton of computers in here. We'll just look at this bottom one because it's easy. All right, so we got the distinguished name. It is enabled, uh, the, uh, the host name. It is a computer, nothing special there. Let's go see what else we can find out. So let's take any of these systems. I don't know what system I want. Let's do VRA-1, shall we?
And as long as I type right, we'll be good, right? Let's come over here and let's uh, DRA-1. Remember, this is Windows, so it is not case sensitive. If we were you know, working in Linux, it would be. So let's see what we find. So here's VRA1, and this is all the information that is actually in the Active Directory. All right, so I'll scroll down here. There's a couple of things talking about enumeration uh, and uh, yeah. All right. So cannot change password. Oh, that's good. We can change our password, our common name. Here's our, can, can I, I can never say it. Can it? Anyways, that name. Um, I don't know why I struggle to say that. Sometimes I can get it spit out and other times I can't. It's all good. Our distinguished name. It's all good. Well, look at this. We got an IP address. Hey, that's cool. So here's our IPv4 address. If we were making use of IPv6, that would be listed there as well. Obviously, we're not. Last login. Um, cool. Lockout, login. Object category. So here is our operating system. So this is a SLES operating system. Uh, this happens to be uh, VRA1. This happens to actually be a vCloud or a vRealize uh, implementation. Uh, they're running on a SLES OS. Uh, the service pack is unknown. The operating system version is 11, so that's good to know. Primary group ID. Lots of good information here, don't you agree? We've got quite a bit of information. Now, let's just talk about uh, hacking systems here and what we're going to want to look for. So this next item, I'm going to go ahead and first paste it in here, and then we'll talk through this. So we're not going to, we're, we're going to gather every VM, we're going to gather every property, and then we're going to list this in a format. So that's a pipe command. We're going to pipe it to a format table. And we're pulling out the name, operating system, operating system service pack, and operating system version. And that is what we're going to take a look at. Scroll over here. And we're going to tell it to wrap and auto space so that we actually get to see everything. Because if you don't put the dash auto in there, it'll cut it off. At, I don't remember how many bytes it is. It'll cut it off and you won't be able to read everything. So we want to be able to read everything. So let's see what we can gather here. How hard is our information gathering today? Woohoo! All right, so there you go. We'll scroll up so you can see what it looks like from the top. Did I wake you guys up? Well, hopefully. Well, better not be sleeping on me. All right, so, and as you can see, this is fun and time consuming. All right, we got a whole, a whole lot of systems here. So we've got our name, we've got our operating system. If the, if the operating system service pack is listed, so this tells me that somebody, um, I'll blame myself on this one, has not updated our Active Directory since the original install. That's probably not a good thing. We don't have any service packs there. Operating system version 6.39600. Now that is really good information. Wouldn't you agree? Now if I'm working as an insider, gathering this information is fairly easy to give to someone that's more skilled. Uh, or, or, or they'll... Okay, now that I know what you guys have in there, here's what you need to do to crack into it, to gather that information, right? So you can roll down through here and, and see a ton of good information. MWHA, MPT, oh, that was a interesting one. So we got a couple of multi-point server 2012 premium. That's kind of cool. Windows 7 Enterprise couple of SLEs, there's some unknowns, so they couldn't, the, the ESXi hosts don't register the proper information, um, but that's interesting because it does say likewise open 6.2. Now that is interesting, so I because I'm a virtualization guy, I know that that means that this is version 6 update 2 um, that's installed on that particular ESXi host, so that's kind of cool. Uh, so I, even though it doesn't tell me, I just did some enumeration there, and I could go gather more information as I, if I needed to. So you scroll down through and see all this. Now that's kind of cool. Now let's just say that you and I are going to say, well, we want to actually 
go right in and look at the 2012 servers. We're gonna, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna simply do our filter for operating system equals to Windows Server 2012 R2 Data Center. And we're looking for properties, all of those properties that we had listed before, but we're only looking for that particular operating system. So there we go. Here's all those systems that have that unique operating system. Well, you know what? That's not quite enough because I need IP addresses. So let's just run another command. Here we go. Now is all the VMs. Boom, away you go. Now, we can easily pipe this out. Uh, um, you can easily pipe this out to a file, right? So we could pipe this out to... systems.txt. Mm, I could also use, I think I'm going to go with CSV. There we go. And you'll see here that I got to go back to this one. Now I've got a systems.csv file. Now I don't have uh, Excel or any other type of spreadsheet uh, in, installed here, but I could open in Word and away we go. So you can see we can pipe that stuff out. Uh, pretty easily as well. All right. So we got all of our operating systems. We kind of know where we want to go, but we're just a general user and we need an administrator account now. And we can't run our get service command. Uh, we, we, uh, we can't clear our logs uh, because we don't have admin rights. So we're going to walk through a common method that's utilized for guessing passwords. Yeah, you got to love that, right? Okay, so I'm a general user. Keep that in mind. We have gathered all of this information from AD as a general user. Now, I do have a password file here. This just got four passwords in it. I We could make this huge. Look, I, I don't want to spend hours going through this. You don't either. We can demonstrate what we're trying to do here. Okay, so... What we're going to do is I've created a script. Now, the first thing I want to do is make sure that my users file is deleted. I'm going to delete this users file here. Okay. All right. We'll come back to it, I promise. Uh, we're going to get the AD user, just like we had done before, dash filter, asterisk, and we're going to select the name, and that's it. And we're going to pipe that into a user's text file. Now, I could do all this together, but I'll explain why I'm doing that here. The part of the reasons why I'm doing that is because I didn't want to write a script that would remove the first three lines. I, I don't want to see the errors related to this. So I'm going to delete those. And now I have just the usernames and the entire list of those usernames that are in our AD. So We'll save that. Away we go. Okay. Now we're going to come back here to our script. So I am defining the domain because we did already gather that information. So this first part is defining the domain. And next we're going to do a simple for each statement. So when you do need to at least get somewhat familiar with PowerShell. I am by no means some crazy expert. I go to others to help with this. I will tell you that if I can figure this stuff out, you can figure it out. It is, it, it is not that hard to do. And what's happening is it's going to read the users.txt file. So the dat, dot backslash users.txt. Now, I did not have to put a folder in it because I am already in the users student 100 directory. And in that directory contains my users text file, right? So we're going to look at that content. So it's going to it's it's going to look at every single item and for every user, dollar sign user, in get contact in that file, we are going to do the rest. So if there's two users, it's going to do this on two of them. If there's a hundred, it's going to do it on a hundred. If there are two twenty two thousand five hundred and forty four, it's going to perform it on two thousand five hundred and forty four. And next, we are changing the user account. We're going to provide the variable dollar sign un. 
what we're doing is we're making sure there is no spaces in the username. Remember, if it pulled in a space, made him, you know, which it, I'm sure it did, if it pulled in a space after any of those names, that would air out when we go to do our password guessing, right? Our dictionary attack. So what we're doing is we're making sure that username has no spaces in it. So we're replacing the space with nothing. So we're just removing the space in the username, which we need to do. And then we're just going to print out on our screen that username so we can see who we're attacking. And then we're doing another for each statement. And you got to make sure you have these brackets before and after. And before and after, they got to be in there. Otherwise, it's not going to work very well. All right, so the, in this for each statement, um, now we are going to look at every password. So if we had 5,277 passwords in our password file, it would run through this for each statement for every user 5,277 times. And fortunately, there's no lockout on the users. So we don't even have to worry about time. We don't have to put a wait statement in here. Because normally we would do this twice, and then we would wait. So for every, or three times, for every, for every th third time, we would put a wait statement in here. And you can do a counter and, and set that up. It's not hard to do. It's another fairly simple process. All right. Now, this next, next item here, you would end up having, you know, like me, I'm not an avid PowerShell user. I had to go look these items up in order to, in order, when we first started doing this, I didn't know what any of this stuff was. I had to go look it up. So I'm doing the exact same thing with the password, making sure there's no spaces in there on every single one of them. And then we are defining the system directory service account management context type as domain. We're going to be utilizing the domain for our account management context type. And then we're creating a new object within our Active Directory under account management, and we're utilizing a principal context format. Now, I am uh, I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you all of the details, what's actually happening here. In the end, we're creating a, attempting to create a new, uh, a, a new object within our AD. Now, we're not going to actually finalize the creation of that, because before we actually finish the creation of the, of the principal context, we're validating the passwords, but then we never actually create the new object. However, this is going to have a ton of logging if set up correct, correctly. So I'm going to show you a secondary method utilizing some executables that are built into PowerShell that do not log near as many details and are easier to bypass loggers. All right, so hide yourself. And, and so now we're going to utilize, so we're creating a new, new object, create based upon dollar sign CT, so it's domain context type account management. And we're t defining the domain, which is the MWHA. We have to have that as well. And then if and only if this equals true, so you're going to run the dollar sign PC, yada, 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 and which is going to be either a true or false. So the username and password is either going to be valid or it's not. And what I've done is I've created a simple if statement. If it's true, tell me it's true. Otherwise, don't do anything. That's all that I'm doing here, all right? So you got all that, right? Let's see what happens. And, of course, we know what we're doing because we have it in our account, but just to show you here. So woo we're testing every single account with all of the passwords in our password file. And only those accounts that have the password, that we have the correct password, does it respond. So now we know all of the different accounts that and their the user accounts and passwords. And one of the ones that's interesting is this one here, the administrator account. We now know the admin account. Woohoo! Yes, this is a De test dev, or sorry, it's a pen testing environment, so of course it's an easy password. All I'm getting at is that if you know your people well enough, you can build a good dictionary file. There's a lot of good dictionary files out there. Uh, when you run this in an environment, it is very likely you're going to find some 
account passwords. Not all. Of course, you're not going to find all. You'll find some. The larger the environment, the more passwords you'll find. It's really interesting uh, how positive this can work. And I just did all of this as a normal user. Now, isn't that cool? Woohoo! Now, and if you're not logging or monitoring everything that's going on within uh, PowerShell, I am monitoring for that. You're not going to even know this is happening. All right. Now, another um, script for guessing passwords is utilizing the DS query, a domain services query executable that is built into PowerShell, built into the operating system, comes with the RSAT commands. Uh, and this is a slightly different way of gathering the information from Active Directory. These executables are designed specifically to do a ton of different information for us related to gathering, changing, editing, whatever it is we want to do uh, within AD. Now, this was actually designed before the AD commands I just demonstrated. Uh, so uh, uh, administrators have been utilizing these for quite some time. Now, we can do the same thing here on this DS query, uh, outputting it to user.txt. Now, uh, I'm going to go and um, delete my user.txt file now. Well, that's users. What did I name this one? Oh, still the same thing. So just going to delete that so I don't have any issues. All right. And then again, another for each statement, and we're getting that content. So the exact same thing we did before, except now we're actually going to be utilizing the DS get command. The DS get command is slightly different. So when, um, uh, let's just do a, let's do a quick DS get, and we'll just do user, administrator, um, okay, because, now why did that just fail? I was just going to try to do a simple, oh wait a minute, still, well, I don't have something quite right here. Don't you hate when that happens? Oh, I know. Need to tell it what I'm actually, did I type administrator right? Still don't have something right. Well, maybe I'll just run the command and make it show you. I went through all of this before and now my mind went blank on me. So typical components, got the script run, did all of this ahead of time, one item at a time, and of course I'm going to have issues. The DS query is querying for the users on the local domain. And then we're going to utilize the dsget command for a specific user gathering the SAM ID. Um, I know what I'm doing. So DS query Well, let's just do it this way. So here is the with the DS query the command that you're going to get all of these lengthy FQDNs. So this is what I've done wrong. I forgot about that. So you're, these are these are your 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 uh, domain your your domain names that are built into uh, the environment. And DS get is actually going to. So now if I do the, and that's what I was doing wrong. Um, it doesn't. You have to have that name in order to make it work. Okay. So now with the DS get command, we're going to be able to see the SAM ID, and this has three entries. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this, and I forgot to run the DS query first, I apologize. So the, um, uh, the reason I wanted to show you this is so that I could explain what was happening here. Now that we have the SAM ID, the SAM ID actually produces three different results. And this is 
SAM ID is the first one, and that is zero. The, the actual name is one, and the DS get succeeded is two. So when we look at assigning a particular variable, we want only the username, student49. So we do not want zero or three, we just want number one. And just like we did before, we're gonna replace the spaces with a null. We're gonna write out that SAM ID so that we can see what it is. And then for every password in the get content, so just like before, going through that same process, but now we're utilizing DS get, which is not logged in PowerShell in the same manner. There is a, there, this is a different component. We're not trying to add um, any new objects. We're simply getting the user items and validating and verifying that they are who they are. Now what happens is, is that we're just gonna null this out so it's not gonna produce any information, but we're gonna be able to utilize um, the final code, which is could be like an error code, the null code, true or false, and anything that produces a true, the dollar sign question mark, is going to write out and give us the information. This is just a slightly different way of producing the exact same stuff. So here we go. And now it's testing. In this case, it, re, it tells us every account. Those that we guessed, it, it produces the password, and those that we didn't, um, it doesn't produce the password. Exact same manner a little bit more stealthy than what we had before. Kind of cool, right? Yeah, woohoo! So here we are hacking away. Now, it's already past my hour, so what are we gonna do here? Well, I'm gonna show you a couple of different commands. First of all, getting OS details. Can, can we, now that we know administrative accounts, of course we can get services of any system that's actually up and running, right? So let's just uh, see if we can run that quickly as the administrator. Well, let me see here. I think, there we go. We'll try it on a different computer name. And of course, huh, well, that's interesting. That computer might not, I just ran this. Uh, I'm not kidding. I just ran this a few hours ago to gather that serv those services as administrators. So that's interesting that we um, uh, that we don't have that information. Huh. Mm -hmm. Well, let let's go ahead and uh, isn't that interesting? So maybe I need to open this again as a Try to get the event log for that system. See, it's not not allowing us to run it all of a sudden. So, I am going to uh, actually close this off, and we're going to open a new one as administrator. Something has changed there. Maybe my session timed out. So we'll go ahead and do that because remember, we do know the administrative username and password. Hopefully it was just a timeout session. There we go, it was just a timeout issue. All right, so here we can see all of the services that are running on this particular system. Not, I just wanted to show you that now that we have that, boom, we can get that information. We're querying directly uh, that particular VM. And um, we can also I'll come back over to my normal session here and go to the uh, event logs. Let's go ahead and, and see about getting event logs. And this is on an RDP session, a multi-point server. We're just gonna gather that information quickly. All right, and we're looking at the newest 10. So here is the newest 10 uh, uh, security logs that have been in there in that particular time. So we take a look at, 
at the time frame here, June 27th, 10.04, 10.04, 10.03. So we've got that understanding. Now we're going to actually pull back and grab we're going to clear now these event logs and see what happens shall we hiding our tracks gotta love that right all right so it says that it finished because there was no error so let's see about getting those well, look at that, 10.06 instead of 10.04. So you start seeing, okay, those are uh, um, uh, quite interesting. Now we only have, and if you, an account was logged off, logged in. So we can see that things have changed a little bit here. And the only logs on there are the latest, newest logs related to uh, what we had just performed here. So, um, and we could go back and, and, and mess around with that. All I'm saying is that this allows us to do it because we're administrators. We had to get to an administrative session. Now, I'm going to, I don't have time to show you everything here, but I do want to walk through uh, setting up a persistent backdoor. So enumeration, not a problem. We're, we're doing all kinds of fun getting usernames and passwords without getting caught. Um, now, leaving a back door, built into Kali is a little known set of tools called PowerSploit. And what, what PowerSploit allows us to do, now we do have to have access to a system. And, and here's what I want you guys to be thinking about. So when we find user accounts associated with particular systems that have RDP enabled on them. Now we can RDP to that system. Usually that's a concern. We RDP to that, that system. And now once on that system, we can set up a permanent or persistent backdoor via PowerShell. Now, what we're trying to do here is leverage an unauthorized user of PowerShell to inject in memory a backdoor attempting to bypass antivirus. Now, I'm going to show you guys the um, uh, PowerSploit. PowerSploit is available in GitHub from PowerShell Mafia. They have antivirus bypass, code execution, exfiltration, setting up persistent systems. In other words, what will happen is, is you can actually migrate to a, um, a service that runs all the time and embed a DLL that will run with that service every time the, the, the system's either logged on to or turned on. So we get, we get that particular component. Sometimes we can escalate our privileges there as well, and there's some additional reconnaissance that, are, that can be done. This is a really nice tool. And maybe, maybe in my next, uh, uh, next session, I, I, uh, well, we do this uh, actually in our class. So I was going to say maybe in the next session, but I'm planning on doing something else for the next session. But it's some good stuff here. Uh, and, and it's not hard to do. You use MSF Venom from, from uh, Metasploit to create your package, upload it, download anything you need in memory. So we're running in memory, which can bypass antivirus. And we actually do antivirus bypass in our course, but I think in our next session, uh, next month, we'll actually do be, be doing an antivirus bypass session. So that's what we're going to try to do in our next session. We don't have the date or time yet. I'll get to that in a moment. Just be thinking, antivirus bypass is what's coming up. All right, so... Uh, um, PowerShell Mafia with PowerSploit, some good stuff. All right, so how do we, we did the covering tracks here. Prevention, sign all your scripts with X509 certificates and set the execution policy to all signed. That will prevent most of this from happening. They would have to be able to sign with your same certificates in order to run. We don't, we, we, that's going to be much more difficult to do. Only have the remote uh, administration tools uh, on your Bastion host. Uh, only set it up on the systems that need it, period. Now, PowerShell version 5 has the ability to do script block logging. We can have system-wide transcripts. Any PowerShell scripts, single codes that's ran will 
be that those transcripts will be logged every single one of them so everything I did even though I was an authorized user would be logged so we can easily track down what the heck was going on that's good now they've also got something new where we can actually make use of app locker uh, to constrain the power cell PowerShell usage now this goes in uh, even greater detail than utilizing signed uh, um, uh, signed, or signed scripts. That is a, a fairly new system as well, which is quite good. So here you go. Those of you that stayed on to the bitter end, <laughs> uh, our next webinar we're gonna we're gonna be doing with uh, doing antivirus bypass. Uh, be on the lookout because we do not have a date yet for that. But be on the lookout. So antivirus bypass uh, uh, utilizing probably utilizing Metasploit, and um, maybe I might even throw in here PowerSploit for that as well. Now, for those of you in the next webinar that stay to the end, will be in the running for a free seat to any of our online classes, whether it's a pen testing class, a cloud security class, a virtualization security class, uh, um, information security class whatever it is you desire that's the way it's going to be so share with your friends or maybe you don't share with your friends maybe you know don't share with anybody to keep your numbers down or you tell your friends about it and tell them if they win they have to give it to you because you share the information with them all right so we do have some uh, upcoming uh, CPTE classes as well uh, lots of good information out here and uh, for those of you that uh, might be interested, you can go to the Mile 2 website for our pen testing engineer outline. Lots of good information here, what we do, what we don't do. Our public schedules, so these are the classes you'd be in the running for, uh, online classes you'd be in the running for if you, if you attend that next webinar. And so you just go to mile2.com slash schedule and away you go here. And be on the lookout, the mile2.com slash schedule slash events. This is where you will find out about our next webinar. We will post that probably with sometime in the next week related to when the next webinar is going to be, and that's going to be on bypassing antivirus. So be aware of that. That's where you go to view that, mile2.com forward slash schedule slash events. And um, if you're already on our email list, you'll receive that information as well. Remember, in the hands-on classes, we endeavor to spend a lot of time with hands-on. You can't get good with penetration testing with security without doing the hands-on. I just went and showed you all of these little links here. Uh, so there they are for you guys. I want to say thank you for your time today. I appreciated it. Uh, um, this is recorded, so everything that we've done will be paid, will be available uh, via our website and or YouTube at a later time so that you can go through practice, spend time, get good at enumeration with PowerShell as a general user. See how many of your, if you're an administrator, see how many passwords you can guess with this particular system. Good stuff, right? All right. You enjoy your day. I'm signing off now. Have fun, and we'll catch you the next go-around.